Hey, there we go. Welcome. I have the green light, but it's not loud. There is it been better? Coming up, coming up. Better? There we go. Praise the Lord. Um, so Cornerstone is walking through a series entitled Life in the Other Six. And you have been given some passages of scripture to read. And last week, um, the passages were 2 Corinthians 4, and then this week it was taking us through the rest of some of the book of 2 Corinthians. And as I was reading through that and praying about the message today, it took me back to a moment in my life that God just kind of really changed who I was to be. And as I reflected on that and was praying into that, I felt like God's like, uh, you need to just share your story. And so there's a lot of new faces here today because I, I just kind of reached out to people that um, are very meaningful to me. And not that all of you that are here aren't. <laughs> More other people that are as well important to me and uh, have impacted my life and their families. Because I wanted them to hear my story. So you see, we all have a story. And the Bible calls it um, a testimony, right? And the Bible also gives another label to a testimony of a believer, and it's called gospel, good news. You know, when your story is walking with God and your story has Jesus in it, that is a testimony of good news. It's gospel. We all have a testimony. One testimony might be with Jesus or it might not be with Jesus. About 20-some, oh man, the years just go by really fast. But 20-some years ago, I uh, stopped, was it that long ago? I'm trying to think. I don't know. When I was 29 years old, <laughs> started. Uh, I was called to be a pastor at a church here in town. It was a church I grew up in. And uh, I pastored there with some other gentlemen for about 12 years. And I was very uh, focused on getting people to come to church. Isn't that what, I guess that's what a pastor's supposed to do, right? I don't know. I don't, it didn't give me a job description. But at the end of 12 years, uh, the church, one of the guys decided to go somewhere else. And the church wanted to go a different direction. And so uh, I kind of got laid to the side. Nicely, okay, not, not, no, no hard feelings there. But at that time, I was, as I look back, I was very cynical of church. I was somewhat frustrated. I wasn't frustrated with people. I was frustrated with how I was, I didn't feel like I was being Jesus. I said, there, there, there's got to be a better way to be Jesus, I didn't feel like I was touching people. I didn't feel like I was impacting people. And so God kind of took me down this uh, path of I had this simple prayer. I said, God, <laughs> show me what it means to be Jesus. Show me what it looks like to be Jesus. Show me your body. Show me your body. I was spending so much time on trying to get people in the church and hardly any time being the church. And so the passage that we have first here is the passage that kind of kind of got God's uh, little knife inside and kind of started turning, you know what I mean? So can you show that one? Do you have it? Okay, bless you. So this, so the best place to start if you're trying to live like Jesus is Matthew chapter 5, 6, and 7. Okay? It's kind of Jesus' bridge when he began his ministry. It's his bridge of tying the law, the Old Testament, that which we read, and making it applicable to daily life. And the passage that really hammered home to me was this one in the first five verses of Matthew 7. It says, do not judge, or you too will be judged. 
For in the same way you judge others, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. You know, if you're in those moments of reflection, this is not a good passage to read. But I was so focused of getting people to come to church. And, and almost to the point like, well, why don't you come to church? You ever been there? What, what is wrong with you? Why are you not coming to church? Church is a good place. Get your hiding in church. But then it goes on. And Jesus is really a wordsmith here. Why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye and pay no attention to the plank in your own eye? How can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye? When all the time there's a huge two-by-four in your own eye. You hypocrite, first take the plank out of your own eye, and then you'll be, you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. I'm just going to tell you right now, I was judgmental. And I have a feeling that we all inherited that same nature. I'm guessing. And all of ours is different. But I'm not here to talk about you today. I'm here to talk about how God has changed me, my story. And so as Jesus kind of laid me out and humbled me a great deal by telling me that I was judging people and I was, uh, I guess the way he put it, and some of you uh, have heard this message before, um, my the bowling pin analogy, God took me bowling. And uh, she said, sometimes Chris... You are the bowler, and you're out there, and you're just rolling things into people's lives and knocking them down. Sometimes you want to be the pin setter upper, where you pick them all up, and you set them the way you think they need to be. Sometimes you just like to sit and watch somebody else knock everybody down because they're not what they're supposed to be doing. Sometimes you're the ball yourself, and you go flying in there and knock people down. And Jesus flat out to me says, Chris, those are not your roles. God is the only one that can draw people to Jesus. Jesus is the judge. Jesus is the one that convicts. The Holy Spirit is the one that draws people. He said, I simply want you to be a pin. I want you to be my pin. I want you to stand amongst all the other pins. I will be the one that allows things to come and knock you down, but it's going to knock you down along with the other people. And then I will be the one that stands you back up. I simply want you to be a pin, my pin. Well, that's kind of a weird analogy, right? But, uh, but it, it starts to change the whole dynamic of I needed to focus on being a faithful pin and not on all the other pins and, and judging them and what, how they should be standing or where they should be standing. So then that kind of takes us to the next verse in Matthew chapter 7. And I'm going to tell you what, this is the weirdest verse in the whole Bible almost. And it took me a long time of scratching my head and just simply asking God, what in the world are you trying to talk about here? Do not give dogs what is sacred. Do not throw your pearls to pigs. Of course, it's the most exciting passage because it has pigs in it. <laughs> Correct? If you do, they may trample them under their feet and turn and tear you to pieces. And, and guys, I tell you what, I struggled years with this passage of just what does this mean? And, and it just, and that was before this time, but, but even now when God's kind of, Jesus is kind of laying me out there with the whole judgmental thing and being a pin, and it's just like this passage is part of that passage. So it's got to have something to do with it, Right? It's not just some random thought Jesus had. And I couldn't figure it out. I couldn't figure it out. It says something about pearls in there. So if you look in the next scripture, and this was found in the passages that we were asked to read. This is the passage that really... Turned my world upside down. And took me to a realization 
of how condemning and how judgmental I was and have the potential to be. Look what it says here. It says, the God of this age, lowercase g, the God of this age, has blinded the minds of unbelievers so that they cannot see the light of the gospel, the good news that displays the glory of Christ Jesus, who is the image of God. For what we preach is not ourselves, but Jesus Christ as Lord, and ourselves as your servants for Jesus' sake. For God, who said, let the light shine out of the darkness, made his light shine in our hearts to give us the light of the knowledge of God's glory displayed in the face of Christ. But we have this treasure in jars of clay to show us that this all-surpassing power is from God. And not from us. Some gracious people brought in some pearls. I'm not going to tell you if they're real or not. I have no idea. But they represent value. Something precious. Okay? And it says that we have this treasure. And it's in this jar of clay. We have some beautiful jars of clay up here. And they are very fragile. And the people that brought these are probably like wanting me to stay far away from them. Things of beauty, but sometimes things that are just plain and simple. But it says we have this treasure of great value, but it's in this fragile jar of clay. And that's what that passage is talking about. What is of great value to us is that we have Jesus Christ. Amen? And that God reached out to me, even though I didn't deserve it. That's grace. Grace is receiving something I don't deserve. And that's a life of relationship with God because of what Jesus did. The removal of my sinfulness because of what Jesus did. And I have this value, this treasure And it's been placed inside of me, in my heart, through the Holy Spirit. Amen? And that should be illuminating out of me this light. This passage goes on and it refers back to Moses in chapter 3 before this of how when he would go into the presence of God, into that tent, and the cloud would come down and he would come out and his face would shine. It would be radiant and the people just couldn't even look at him. He had to put a veil over his face. And then, and then it would fade. But brothers and sisters, we now have that presence of God living inside of us all the time. Amen? And there should be this radiance that comes from us. I don't know. I'm sure if you ask my family, if you ask some people that are really close to me, that there's probably not a radiance all the time flowing from my face. But I have this great treasure. The next passage goes on and it says this. Go ahead. Flip that one. Jesus was talking. And he was talking about the kingdom of God. Because people were asking about it. And he says here, The kingdom of heaven is like a merchant looking for fine pearls. And when he found some of great value, he went away and sold everything he had. And he bought them. Do we see the tremendous value in what we've been given? And I guess I'm going to ask myself, I don't know if I do or I did. I was inviting people. I was asking people. I was judging people based on what they were doing or not doing. Rather than embracing the treasure that I have been given and illuminating that in my life so that those in darkness, blinded by the enemy, can see. Remember when the man that Jesus healed from being blind on the Sabbath? You'll find that, I think it's in Matthew, one of those, it's one of the Gospels. I'm sorry, I don't have it off the top of my head. But that is the longest story 
story of a miracle that we ever see in Scripture. The longest. I mean, it just goes on and on and on. I mean, it's like a couple chapters. And at the end of that, Jesus is like, I came for those that were blind so that they could see. He's not talking about physical blindness. He's talking about the blindness that we read about from the God of this age. And so the revelation that God brought to me is that, brothers and sisters, we, there are two kingdoms. Two. Two kingdoms. And I don't know if you can see it or not, but we have a box on a bread rack with rollers. Okay? Are you with me? That represents the kingdom of the world. Do I need to hold it up? All right. Is that better? All right. On this side, we have a box. And it's on concrete blocks, and I'm not going to lift them up. But this is the kingdom of God. Okay, are you with me? Now I need Dennis, Gabe, and Japheth. Come up here. <laughs> and I need Jeff. Okay. In our role play here, we have... You switch places. No, you stay. We have Father... Son and brother. We understand that? Father, son, and brother. For those of you that don't know them, this is true. We have father, <laughs> son, and brother. But this is imagery here. This is our relationship. We have God the Father, we have Jesus the Son, and that those of us who believe what God has done through Jesus and have asked him to be our Lord and our Savior, we now become brothers and sisters to Jesus, right? Jeff, today, this is so out of character, you're going to be devil, okay? Okay? So, can, can you do like a... <laughs> with some, whoa. Oh, there we go. Right, okay. okay. Japheth, you're going to be doing all the crazy stuff, so come on. I need you to step in here. Please don't hurt yourself, okay? You and a hand up here. Oh, here, take my hand. Come on. Okay, this is the starting point of our life. We are automatically in the kingdom of the world, okay? Just are. I mean, many of us believe that as a child we, we're growing up and we're still under the arms of Jesus until that age where we understand that we need to turn and, and repent. But this is kind of where we're at, okay? Are you with me? Okay. So, Jeff, I need your help here. All right. Um, I need you to tie that one to his knee on that side. Okay. See, the season is not over. I just, uh, it's okay. We're going to be gentle. Okay, just tie it to his knee. Okay, and then you need to tie this one to his arm. Okay, all right. Bear with me. Be patient. Is that too tight? You're in the kingdom of the world, so it don't matter. Okay, Jeff, those are yours. Okay, hold on a second. Jeff, here you go, bud. I want you to climb up there. Okay, go ahead. Climb on up there. Is that a good spot? You want to move a little bit? I, I, well, I don't know what you want me to do. Cause You're fine. Do. You're fine. Okay. So, the imagery, and I use this a lot when I walk with people, uh, is that, that, that we have a kingdom of the world, okay? And, and I think we need to go to some passages of scripture. Go ahead. What's next? Uh, okay. Yeah, I'm a little behind. Once, when asked, Jesus, uh, he said, when the Pharisees asked Jesus when the kingdom of God would come. Jesus replied, the coming of the kingdom of God is not something that can be observed, nor people can say, here it is or there it is, because the kingdom of God is in your midst. And if you look at some of the other versions or you look at the little highlight in your midst, it talks about inside of you. And we know that, right? The Holy Spirit comes and dwells inside of us, and we have this relationship with God. And Jesus said in John 6, he said that eternal life is knowing God the Father and knowing me the Son. 
okay? And that we transport into a new life. Let's go to the next one. Are you okay up there? Okay. So listen, I, we, this is a long passage here, but we have to do this one. Or Jeff, you, you're you going to okay? All right. In Revelation 12, this explains this whole analogy here. Listen. A great sign appeared in heaven. A woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, and a crown of 12 stars on her head. She was pregnant, and she cried out in pain, and she was about to give birth. Then another sign appeared in heaven, an enormous red dragon with seven heads and ten horns and seven crowns on its head. Its tail swept a third of the stars out of the sky and flung them to the earth. The dragon stood in front of the woman who was about to give birth so that it might devour her child the moment he was born. She gave birth to a son, a male child, who will rule all the nations with an iron scepter. This is referring to Christ. And her child was snatched up to God in his throne. The woman fled in the wilderness to a place prepared for her by God where she might be taken care of for 1,260 days. Go ahead. Keep going. Then war broke out in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against that dragon, and the dragon and his angels fought back, but he was not strong enough, and they lost their place in heaven. This is an important verse. Listen. The great dragon who was hurled down, that ancient serpent called the devil or Satan, who leads the whole world astray, he was hurled to the earth and his angels, demons, with him. Next one. Then I heard a loud voice in heaven say, Now have come the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Messiah. For the accuser, that would be Jeff, of our brothers and sisters who accuses them before our God day and night has been hurled down. They triumphed over him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony, which you're hearing today from me. They did not love their lives so much as to shrink from death. Therefore, rejoice, you heavens, and you who dwell in them. But woe to the earth and the sea, because the devil has gone down to you. He's filled with fury because he knows that his time is short. It goes on. When the dragon saw that he had been hurled to the earth, he pursued the woman who had given birth to the male child. The woman was given two wings of a great eagle so that she might fly to the place prepared for her in the wilderness where she would be taken care of for a time and times and a half time out of the serpent's reach. Then from his mouth the serpent spewed water like a river to overtake the woman and sweep her away with a torrent. But the earth helped the woman by opening its mouth and swallowing the river that was the dragon had spewed out of his mouth. Then the dragon was enraged at the woman, and he went off to wage war against the rest of her offspring, those who keep God's commands and hold fast to their testimony about Jesus. Go to the next one. The coming of the lawless one will be in accordance with how Satan works. He will use all sorts of displays of power through signs and wonders that serve the lie and all the ways that wickedness deceives those who are perishing. They perish because they refuse to love the truth and so be saved. Now this takes us to our two kingdoms. The devil's here on earth, amen? And hell was created for his punishment, eternal punishment. Amen? Right. And God is choosing not to send any of us to hell. We choose to go ourselves when we don't follow Jesus or accept the gift of Jesus. This is the state we're born in. And the imagery to me is that the devil is kind of, I call him the puppeteer. The puppeteer. And we're on kind of a shaky grounds here a little bit. Glenn and and, uh, Terry. Alex, come on up. Evan, come on up. Okay. So, when we're in the kingdom of the world, uh, you guys, two of you grab those mirrors right there. Okay. Alex, you come over here, bud. When we're in the kingdom of the world, the foundation that we're standing on, it's kind of spongy, isn't it? A little bit. And, and if I do something like this, how does that work? Is that, is that okay? No. No? Okay. So 
So what happens is, is that Jesus said that, that the devil is uh, the father of what? Father of lies, and he's been lying since the beginning. I know I've got those passages up there. We'll catch up to them sometime. But he has the ability through lies to tell us whatever he wants us to hear. You see, when, when we partook of the fruit in the Garden of Eden, it gave us the knowledge of good and the knowledge of evil. And so sometimes, guys, come over here. He'll put up around these mirrors. You, know, you hold it up to him. Hold it up to him. And, 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 and Glenn, you come over here. And, and Alex, and I want you to be like going like this. And I want you to say, yes, yes, yes. And so, so what you see is that the focus, the focus sometimes when the devil wants us to, it can be on ourselves, right? And, and, and you know, um, go to the next slide. I think it's, yeah, remember when Jesus was tempted? What, this is one part of that. Look what he says. The devil led him up to a high place and showed him in an instant all the kingdoms of the world. And look what he says. I will give you all their authority and splendor. It has been given to me. And I can give it to anyone I want to. If you worship me, it will all be yours. So I have been observing in the people's lives that I walk with, and what I observe is that the devil can do a lot of different things. But one of the things that he can do is that he can make Japheth's life great. Wealth, prosperity, happiness. Can the devil do that? Yes, he can. And why? Why would the devil want to do that? Take his eyes off his, a need. You see, like right now, Japheth is in the kingdom of, of, of the world. And he's not in relationship with God. The other thing that the devil can do is, I want you to go like this. I want you to go boo, boo, <laughs> boo. What about that? What about that? Are there people out there that have such a s terrible self-image and, and, and have got, done some rotten things and that they, have, they feel like they have no self-worth? They don't feel good enough, deserving enough? And there's just this manipulation. And it can go on and on and on and on. You guys can sit down. You have to stay. Thank you, guys. The cool thing about the whole thing is that God and Jesus, they're always standing by. And the whole time that all that is going on, their arms are out, and they're calling Japheth to them. And that all Japheth has to do is turn and want to go to them, right? And so his life will begin to start to, you ready? His life is going to be hard, but he's going to start to move toward, you're making this harder than it should be. Come on, man. <laughs> Come on, let's go. There we go, here we go, here we go. You all right, Jeff? So look what happened. All of a sudden we lost a tie. But Jesus has the ability, the wonderful ability, when we ask him to cut those strings from us and to remove us from the control or the power of the enemy. There's two things that I believe happen, and, and many of you have heard this over and over again, but this is, this is part of my testimony, and it, and, and it has become a huge part of my understanding that when we are baptized... We go down into that water. We ask Jesus to forgive us of our sins. We ask God to forgive us of our sins. We believe that Jesus died on the cross, that his blood was shed to, to save me from my sins. It's at that moment I'm making this one-time surrender. I'm saying it's not my life anymore. It's your life, this one-time surrender. And Jesus, you are my Savior. You've heard me say that over and over. 
But when we come up out of that water, that mm -hmm. life that we surrendered now needs to re will receive and be baptized with the God's Holy Spirit. And now every day I need to submit to Jesus as my Lord. You see, what will happen is, is that there's a lot of, hey, help me here, Jeff, We're gonna, or Dennis, get him moved over there. There's a lot of us in this world, you're going to put your left leg in that other box. Let's see if you can do it. This stay right like that. There's a lot of us in this world that have Jesus as our Savior. We got our foot in the kingdom. But there's a lot of us in this world that want to keep this one, the Lord, in the kingdom of the world. And what happens is, is that the devil and all those other demons and stuff and the things are always going to want to pull us. What's going to happen if I kept pulling? Something's going to fall, right? Something's going to give. Something isn't going to work. There's going to be instability there. Until we decide that we're going to make Jesus our Savior and our Lord. There won't be this strong foundation. Now, I need you to scoot up a little bit. I need you to get in the box. And I need you to put your arms around him. And I need you to put your arms around both of them. Yes, I'm telling you that ever since I made this decision, my life has been wonderful. And it has been a fairy tale where everything has gone wonderful and I feel warm and fuzzies all the time. That would be a lie. But the reality is, is that this is real and this is true. And this image is not lying to us. The devil is going to do whatever he can to break this bond. But Japheth is in the arms of Jesus and in the arms of God. And so can I be. And, and I cannot tell you. So you guys can go ahead and sit down. So this whole thing began. I better check the next slide. What's the next slide? Oh, here we go. This whole thing began with Matthew 7 challenging me about being judgmental. And my judgment was on people in the box in the kingdom of the world. And isn't that kind of the M.O. of all of us a little bit? But when you go back to that 2 Corinthians 4 passage where it says the God of this age has blinded the unbeliever. Blinded. So that they can't see or understand the value of this treasure. What should be stirring inside of me is not condemnation, but compassion. Compassion that someone is blinded and cannot see. Blind and cannot see. And why should I have compassion? Because I was also blinded and couldn't see until Jesus set me free. You know, in Romans, it talks about being a slave to sin. But then what Jesus did and because of what Jesus did, when I make him my Savior and my Lord, now I'm a slave to righteousness, a slave to obedience. I, Jesus is my Lord. Oh, there you go. You threw me off. So my understanding of this passage, do not give dogs what is sacred. Do not throw your pearls to pigs. If you do, they may trample them under their feet and turn and tear you to pieces. My understanding of this is that we are in this kingdom of God box, right? 
And we understand this treasure and our eyes have been open. But those that are in the kingdom of the world and have not yet had their eyes open and have not yet seen Jesus and have not experienced the Holy Spirit in their life, they are not going to understand the value of this treasure. They're not going to understand the value of it. They're also not going to understand what it means to live a life of love or a life of forgiveness or a life of mercy or a life of whatever you might want to call it. Everything that comes from God's Holy Spirit living in us that we have seen modeled in Jesus, they are not going to understand that. They are not going to operate that way. They're not going to function that way. They're not going to see a value in that. We can't, I'm not trying to call people dogs and pigs that are in the kingdom of the world, but I believe that's what Jesus is talking about. They're not going to understand this treasure, this value. And the only way that they're going to see it is when Jesus says that only God can draw people to me. In John 6, only God can draw people to me. So we have this treasure, and it's in this jar, and if I fall, I'm sorry. And the only way that people are going to see it is by it illuminating in us, radiating from us. It's through the power of prayer. If we have people that are in the kingdom of the world and they don't yet know Jesus, then I'm going to encourage you and I, pray Pray. Now, if you didn't hear me the first time, pray and pray and pray again. God is the only one that can change people. God is the only one that can draw people. And he desires to do that, doesn't he? What's the next one here? This goes along with this. Paul tells us, For we are to God the pleasing aroma of Christ. And we're a pleasing aroma to those who are being saved and to those who are perishing. We are the smell of death. It didn't go on there, but that's in part of it. Do you understand that? They're not going to understand why we live the way we do. They don't understand the treasure that we have in this. And the only way is not us beating them on the head and saying, why aren't you in church? Or why aren't you reading your Bible? Why aren't you doing this? Why aren't you doing that? It's going to be us just showing compassion and praying for them and loving them. Jesus made it pretty simple. He's like, Chris, dude, what's your problem? I said, love me, love your neighbor, and love your enemies. And pray for those that persecute you. Pretty simple. What's the next one? Oh, this is this the last one? No, two more? Okay. Sorry. I just kept my notes in my Bible. It doesn't do good to follow them. This is my favorite verse. Those of you that don't know that, you do now. I use this all the time. I've been trying not to use it, so hopefully you appreciate that, but I had to bring it out for my testimony. To me, this is surrender. And this is submission. I have been crucified with Christ, and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. That's my surrender. Now, the life I live now in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God. Now, my definition of faith is taking that which we know, that which we know, and believing it so much that it changes everything I do and say and think. That's what faith is. Taking what I know and believing it so much that it changes everything I think and say and do. So now, wait a minute, I wasn't ready. <laughs> I live by faith in the Son of God, Jesus, who loved me and gave himself up for me. You know what? I am, I am fully capable of any moment of every day of whining and complaining about woe is me. Anybody else here have that problem? Or how bad I've got it. This was a week with CJ's passing that put that a little bit more in perspective. I don't got it too bad. 
But we all have that capacity in us to be that way. But you know what? We have got to come to the realization that every moment of every day, we just have to understand that the devil's trying to come at us with all this stuff and pull us out of that kingdom and, and pull us into the world. And we just have to say, look, buddy, I no longer live. It's not my life anymore. It was bought by a price, the blood of Jesus, and I am now his slave. He is my Lord, and I'm going to just live for him. And whatever he wants to do, so be it. I know that sounds really simple, but it's complicatedly hard. But it's the reality. And I have to live my life that way. And I can tell you, that is so stress-free when you just say, it doesn't matter what happens. And why does it not matter? Because Jesus is coming back. And the devil is going to hell forever. And there's going to be a new heaven and a new earth. And I don't know what that's going to be like, but I can guarantee it it's going to be awesome. Right? Okay, I thought I was done, but what else do I have? Oh, yeah, it's a good one. This was right when Jesus was getting to start his ministry. And, and, and I tell you what, this was an eye-opener for me, too. Do you remember what uh, Gabe did with the scissors? Right? Listen to this. Jesus went to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, and on the Sabbath day he went into the synagogue, as was his custom. Jesus went to church. Come on, what's the matter with you? Uh, he stood up to read. Sorry, that was bad. So he stood up to read, and the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him. He unrolled it. He found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoner and recovery of sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Then he rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant, and sat down. The eyes of everyone in the synagogue were fastened on him. He began by saying to them, Today, this scripture was, is fulfilled in your hearing. That's, Jesus had a big scissors in his hand when he was saying that, right? Jesus has come to set us free. Set us free. Do we understand that? I mean, the devil can get us to buy into any narrative here. Well, that's okay. Well, that's okay. Well, everybody else thinks that's okay. You're not okay. That's all right. Look at our society today. Sexual immorality. Well, this is okay. Well, this is okay. No, it's not. If we get back to the basics, we get back to the foundation, this is what God says, and this is what is real, and this is the truth, and this does not ever change. We can't be listening to the lies of the enemy who has no desire for your life to be good. All he wants to do is get back at God because he knows his time is short and that he's going to hell and he's going to try to take some of God's precious children with him. Amen? I don't know how many of you here have livestock. Is there any livestock? Mike, are you out there somewhere? Mike? Yes. Okay. Just so you know, um, this was a treacherous week for livestock producers, just so you know. And I'm going to tell you this. Do any of you remember the Carol Burnett show? Are any of you old enough to remember that? <laughs> okay, so do you remember when Tim Conway used to play Mr. Tudball or whatever and how he would walk like this? Okay, so if you would be observing me doing chores this week, <laughs> I would look like Mr. Tudball. Right, Jason? Because I'm telling you what, you took a normal stride, you were like, whoo, gone. Ice. Man, lots of ice. There was one day this week where there was probably this much water on top of this much ice. And that is just like hydroplane city. Right? Can somebody look up? Did anybody have a passage of scripture God gave them this morning that happened to be Psalm 116? 
Can somebody look up Psalm 116 and read the first nine verses for me? Anybody? Somebody? Anybody? I don't have it memorized. Roger, you got a big voice. Do you want to stand up and read that for me? 116, verse 1 through 9. And I want you to think about, in the kingdom of, of the world, it's kind of like doing chores on ice, okay? You, 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 you're, you're moving, but, but everything is, is dangerous and everything is slippery. Am I in trouble? Okay, I'm sorry. Oh, Roger, gotcha. I need you to talk into this mic so that people online can hear. Do you not want to do it? I have problems. <laughs> okay, he can't see. How about you, Matt? You good? Okay. Stand up and do it, would you, bud? 116. 116, 1 through 9. I love the Lord because he has heard my voice and my supplications. Because he has inclined his ear to me, therefore I will call upon him as long as I live. The pains of death surround me, and the pangs of Sheol laid hold of me. I found trouble and sorrow. Then I called unto the name of the Lord. O Lord, I implore you, deliver my soul. Gracious is the Lord and righteous. Yes, our God is merciful. The Lord preserves the simple. I was brought low, and he saved me. Return to your rest, O my soul, for the Lord has dealt bountifully with you. You have delivered my soul from death, my eyes from tears, and my feet from falling. I will walk before the Lord in the land of the living. We have been rescued. We have been saved. We have been set free from death. Amen? I just felt like I needed to share with you my story today. That... When Jesus Christ comes into our lives, he gives us a heart of compassion for those that are yet still blinded. If we can leave this place as brothers and sisters in Christ with this lens, that there are only two people in this world. There's only two kinds of people in this world. Those that have, can see Jesus and those that are not seeing him yet. And if we can stop the categorizing and we can stop the judgment of putting people in boxes that don't need to be there. We can then have compassion. Does that make sense? That there are a ton, a ton of people out there that don't see Jesus yet. That don't have this treasure and part of the problem is that we don't see the value in the treasure that we already have. So that other people can see it as well. I do not know where anybody's at today. And this was not a, a message of condemnation on anyone sitting here. It's not as just as easy as saying, oh, Jesus, I want you to be my Lord, and now I'm good, I'm in this box, and it'll always be wonderful, because it won't. There are going to be times that I'm going to find myself with one foot in that box. But that's grace and mercy. I love God. I love Jesus. I love you. And there's a lot of people in this world that I don't know, that I don't like, but I have to love. Because this gift was not just for me. This gift was not just for you. That passage goes on and it talks about us in that clay pot and it says we're, we're pressed in and we're, we're perplexed and, and there's lots of stuff going on, but we're still that clay pot with the treasure. Jason, I think we're going to sing that song again, if that's all right. And I, I love that last song we sang, Death Was Arrested. And, and I guess, let's stand and sing that again. And I don't know where you're at as far as Jesus is my Savior, Jesus is my Lord, you know, that, or whatever. Or if you find yourself in a kingdom. But, man, let this be your song today where 
if you got strings that are attached to you that they can be cut, um, just be set free. Oh, free washes over.